So welcome to the second TPOP event of the year and to anyone joining us via the um, JNCC Science Talks, welcome um, too. I'm going to shortly say something about what TPOP actually is for, for those particularly joining from the Science Talk and unveil the, the, the mystery there um, before inviting David Roy, who's the head of the Biological Record Centre, to give us a presentation on how the Bravery contract um, which is um, between UKCEH and JNCC supports the Biological Records Centre. Um, this memorandum of um, agreement has existed in some form since JNCC came into being, um, but we're currently at the end of uh, this five-year MOA. Um, also, I'm Hannah Hoskins and I am the lead um, on the JNCC side of this uh, in the UK Systems Analysis team. Um, but as usual with the science talks, um, and hopefully familiar to folk um, who came to the TPOP event on Wednesday. We're going to be using Jamboard for any questions you might have for David um, during um, during his talk. Um, and Nikki is going to pop uh, a link in the chat and uh, then he can uh, answer them at the end of his presentation. So just quickly to say something about um, what TPOP is. So um, is potentially yeah, another another acronym as we love here at JNCC. Um, but um, and for those who are familiar with TPOP or joined us last week, um, just bear with me for a minute or two um, as I have directly stolen this from Nikki. So uh, yeah, thank you, Nikki. Um, so uh, on based on this slide here, so the organisations in the box on the left um, in various combinations fund. Uh, organize, run and steer the terrestrial monitoring and surveillance um, that appears in the box on the right hand side. Um, and so for that reason, because there is such a combination of different organizations and there are some um, evident uh, opportunities to share guidance and facilitate communication across the sector, the um, UK TPOP or TPOP is what we normally call it, uh, which is the UK Terrestrial Evidence Partnership of Partnerships, Partnership of Partnerships was um, created to bring together JNCC's partners uh, working in this field um, uh, of biodiversity surveillance and monitoring. Uh, and so the underlying principle here is one of collaboration and knowledge exchange with the benefit of enhancing efficient and effective joint working, uh, because at the end of the day, many of the challenges and opportunities um, relevant for engaging volunteers um, with monitoring of one taxon are also relevant for other taxa. Um, so it's beneficial for us to work together, et cetera. And so since TPOP was founded six years ago, um, as well, it's worth saying that this, um, this sort of official TPOP network has now expanded to welcome uh, other organisations who are keen to collaborate and discuss um, these kind of um, opportunities and um, yeah uh, for collaboration etc so yeah that's that's sort of what TPOP is uh, and uh, if anybody joining from the science talk or, or any TPOP event for the first time would like to know more uh, the email address on the side which is tpop at jncc.gov.uk uh, is worth um, Popping an email there to, to, to follow up with any questions. Um, and then just to say that this um, event is part of the TPOP Festival of 2022. So uh, many folks would have joined us on Wednesday, um, which is a really, I thought I, I found a really useful discussions were had there. Um, and there are some other events taking place. Um, and so I won't go into them now, but if anybody who's joining from the science talks um, is interested in more, once again, please email tpop at jncc.gov.uk. So that was just a very quick, uh, yeah, run through of that. And I will now hand over to David to actually tell you all the interesting stuff. So thanks, David. Great. Yeah, well, thanks for that introduction, Hannah, and thanks for this opportunity to talk about the work of the Brevi partnership. Um, both to the TPOP group, but also more widely. So as, as Hannah said, this um, is a program to support the work of the Biological Records Center, which itself has a very long history and the agreement with JNCC has a long history. So I'll try and focus on the work specifically done under the Brevi uh, partnership with JNCC, but um, there are other projects which sort of link in and some of the things I'll talk about have, have been um, also funded through other opportunities or through other projects. Yeah, so the, as I say, the, the Brevi, I'll call it Brevi now because it's a bit of a mouthful otherwise, is a partnership to uh, maintain and further develop 
the work of the Biological Records Centre to support volunteer scheme coordination, data management and communication. So it's really fundamental to it is to supporting um, a whole range of organisations who themselves support a lot of biological recording activity. So before I talk about that in more detail, I think in terms of context, the um, BRC predates the word citizen science, but obviously citizen science is a big growth area and biological recording is one type of citizen science. So this animation shows work that summarises a quite a large review that was undertaken under UKOF project um, to look at the landscape of citizen science. I guess the main conclusion was that there's been a sort of evolution, growth, diversification in citizen science activities since the 1990s when many um, BRC uh, national recording schemes had already started. But we've seen this, this development into more elaborate approaches and a tendency towards mass participation type projects. And this, a lot of this was stimulated by the use of new technologies. So many of the mass participation activities are um, online or heavily online. So picking apart this, so each, each dot on here is a project which is put on these axes of being relatively simple to elaborate in terms of what they ask of people to contribute. And from uh, left to right, quite systematic or quite detailed um, sampling or expertise required to contribute through to mass participation events. And the BRC type schemes all fell or national schemes fell within this, this segment. So they tend to be relatively simple in terms of they're trying to capture observations of wildlife. So what was seen, when it was seen, where it was seen, who saw it. The real mandate for where people go to record and how long they take, how much effort they take, etc. So quite a general approach to recording. And what we've seen is that these opportunistic recording schemes have tended to become, uh, well, some of them certainly have tended to become in terms of widening participation by involving more audiences and again using um, technologies. So this puts the, the work of BRC around wildlife recording, opportunistic recording, which, which is distinct from perhaps the more structured schemes under TPOP such as um, an example here from the bat monitoring scheme, but the UK butterfly monitoring scheme, national plant monitoring scheme, uh, the bird schemes tend to be more elaborate in terms of uh, fixed locations, fixed methods, et cetera. So just to put in context of where, context of where BR sits, BRC sits or wildlife recording sits in this um, landscape of citizen science. And what we've also seen is, I mentioned widened participation. We've certainly seen the growth in this area of uh, people being interested in wildlife and submitting observations, submitting really valuable data. I think this was encapsulated quite nicely by a visualization that was done through the Natural History Museum to look at the, uh, the impact of the, the first COVID lockdown when uh, access to land was quite restricted, people were at home, but were enjoying uh, wildlife in their surroundings, um, perhaps more time to, to observe and record wildlife. So we saw this quite a large increase in the number of records submitted, in this case through iRecord, but that was paralleled in other systems. So we, we are seeing more people involved um, in wildlife and greater participation, which is, which is a fantastic direction of travel, but clearly provides some challenges in terms of how we uh, manage the data and support the recording schemes in um, bringing along new audiences. So I'm so in terms of that sort of context of work, context of where BRC sits, and I'm going to sort of pick, pick up on some of these aspects of the main aims of the BRC uh, work under the Brevi partnership. So primarily it's to maintain regular contact with around 100 national schemes and societies, help them to manage and mobilize their data where they need help from technical support, um, and particularly um, support them in reviewing data coming from a diverse set of projects and activities and a widening uh, participation a wider involvement for more people, perhaps with a, a wider range of um, skills 
or uh, um, uh, abilities to identify tax upfront, for example. So to support the schemes and how to review those multiple data sources, and then ultimately to support the use of biological records for a whole range of outputs. The Brevi project particularly focuses on outputs to support recording schemes themselves in terms of how they promote their activities and engage their audiences. But these outputs coming from this recording, the work of uh, biological recording has many other uses. And I'll give some examples of those towards the end. So the I've mentioned a few times recording schemes and national schemes and societies, just to put a, a bit of context about what this means is that BRC lists around 105 um, schemes and societies, and that includes um, relatively unstructured uh, recording schemes, um, but also includes under this umbrella is the more structured approaches and some more informal study groups. And these are the real heroes of the biological recording world, I think, is the, the highly expert often national experts, international experts in their taxon groups who coordinate effort around particular taxon groups. So each recording scheme focuses on a particular part of the biota um, and uh, do a huge amount of work to stimulate um, effort, review data and produce outputs. And I guess we're really pleased, certainly in the last few years, to see uh, newer schemes um, being developed. So the two example here shown on the right is Liam Old's work on oil beetles and Warren Maguire um, extending the, the, the myriad pod and isopod groups to cover marine isopods, for example. So we are still seeing an appetite for new recording schemes to focus around particular taxon groups, which is really welcome. And often younger and very enthusiastic people, which also um, great boon to this area, I think. So uh, the this recording scheme activity and the work of BRC and the involvement of national schemes, I think the real advantage is that it gives us the, the largest taxonomic view, widest taxonomic view on biodiversity in the UK, which um, is important complement to the more structured schemes because it's, it's would be very challenging to have more structured schemes for many of these groups. So our evidence base relies on opportunistic recording across a whole range of taxa, illustrated here by this tree of uh, uh, national recording schemes um, produced for the, the 50th anniversary celebrations of, of BRC. And what it shows around the circle is the taxon groups with recording schemes and the circles indicate where there's been an atlas or a repeat atlas. And if we were to update this again, I'm sure there'd be more, well, there would definitely be more circles as new atlases have been produced for uh, a number of groups. And this focus on atlases is, is I guess, been what BRC has often been known for, but it's like, I think it's really important, still remains a really important output for schemes to summarize the status of a whole group and also to give feedback to recorders who are often motivated by contributing to a project which culminates into an into an atlas. Uh, typically a physical book, but also together with online um, outputs as well to support to support the books and provide a more interactive um, outputs for the activities of the recording schemes. And those atlases themselves represent a huge volunteer effort from uh, all the way from individuals submitting records through to experts verifying records and ultimately those who lead on the publications of atlases, um, journal papers, both national and also outputs targeted local and national reporting. When this was last assessed, or I think it was when it last assessed, it was a figure around 70,000 individuals contributing each year, but I'm sure this number is much higher now because um, we know from some of the online systems that they get a uh, very big uptake. So a huge volunteer effort um, contributing to the collection of biological records and um, ensuring its quality and using it for research and conservation. 
And just to highlight that there is the appetite still remains for um, outputs um, such as this. Just want to advertise the the uh, next plant atlas, which will be published um, sometime around spring 2023. And I guess it illustrates where uh, the complementary skills from the recording schemes and BRC um, contributing can um, work together effectively to provide different inputs but to produce a much uh, more richer output. So the real hard work is done here is done by the, the members of the BSBI, the recorders, county recorders and the national uh, staff to bring this all together. But I'll get the contribution from the Brevi pro program and BRC's work is to support the analysis of the data to understand how plant distributions have changed over many, uh, many decades. And also to alongside this atlas will be an interactive online website to um, present the information from the atlas, but also more interactive views on the data and linking to other data sources. So to move on to, um, so I've sort of focused on some of the outputs there for recording schemes as atlases, but to get to that point requires investment in support in terms of managing and mobilizing data in this diverse landscape of projects and activities. And this is where uh, the work of the Brevi program has puts a huge amount of eff effort and emphasis in providing a technical capability but also liaising with recording schemes to understand what issues they face and what uh, potential solutions might make their jobs easier to deal with this volumes of data. And that's really in the context that this is a, anybody who's sort of in the middle of this biological recording world would know it's quite a complex mix of organizations, systems, activities that um, support different aspects of the recording world or different um, entry points or different emphasis on why this data is needed from um, individuals to recording groups, also spanning local environmental record centers, research projects, government agencies, all potentially generating data that enters the system potentially in different routes. And ultimately we, we want them to be made available for use which um, a key part of that is making the data available through data aggregation, such as the MBN Atlas, um, various marine systems, and ultimately um, global systems such as GBIF. And new things come along to add to this. So recent examples being, well, most recently, I guess, iNaturalist UK, but also iSpot also uh, added to this ways of collecting and reviewing data, which can can develop new and interesting ways of doing things, but it needs to, I guess the challenge is how it, it fits into the, to the existing processes and landscapes so that we have data of known quality to support conservation and research. So the BRC's role in this or priorities to support this area is a recognition that the diversity of systems is probably inevitable given the um, options through online systems. But to make them most effectively work together, the priorities that we're focusing on are is to promote and adapt common standards in terms of species nomenclature, but also other um, international standards where we have good reason for doing so, connect data systems together. So they work, um, provide complementary functions. Given the, as the increase in data and the, uh, the pressure that that may put onto experts to, to help review data, to look at ways of automating or, uh, or, or use of automated tools to help that review be more effective. And particularly supporting the, the role of uh, reviewing of data, the verification function, which is often um, you know, highly specialized, but can be um, a huge workload for those who've got the expertise to contribute and ultimately support the data use and flow at various levels from local through to international. I'm just going to expand on that in a bit more detail in terms of 
the BRC Brevi work in this space is that most of it is focused around use of iRecord and other indicia systems, which have shown a an increase uptake of people contributing data. This nice illustration from Tom August shows a steady increase. Um, and I'm sure it's it's continuing if we were up to update this. And from the recorder, spec, recorder perspective, I guess we are focusing on the data being entered once, but then it flows automatically to the national recording schemes for the verification role, directly to local record centers to support their use um, immediately. And where the recording, through the recording schemes, then publish data to the MBN Atlas and onto the global systems. And more recently, oh, and also a direct um, flow to conservation organizations who are managing land and want to uh, evaluate the, um, the impact of their work more directly. So we have direct feeds to the Woodland Trust, RSPB and National Trust for their reserves, for example. And more recently is to establish interchange with other systems that are um, well either relatively new and, and growing in use, such as iNaturalist or BirdTrack, which is focused on a um, does an excellent job for the uh, bird data and also is um, collecting non non bird data that they would like to mobilize to other experts to review. So we have this uh, two way data exchange with BirdTrack to flow data and verification decisions or views on the data uh, two ways. And that mechanism has potential to be used for other taxon group if there are um, other activities that are interested in pursuing that. And what this has seen as well as an increase in recorders is a, an increase in data volumes coming through iRecord. So this illustrates three main sources, iNaturalist in blue, um, which is growing steadily, I would say. I think this the blue bar will go up for 22 at the end by the end of the year. I record will certainly go up a lot because we get a lot of um, data input by spreadsheets over the winter, for example, as those who like to collect data that way will import it into the system. And similarly, the gray bar is other systems which link into this, which is um, things such as the UK butterfly monitoring scheme and plant monitoring scheme. Again, their main danger entry period is over the winter. So I think this will go um, probably up to around three million, two and a half, three million records at the end of the 2022. So we are seeing a growth in the uptake of these systems. And the advantage or the, the reason why we're investing in these systems and particularly the verification tools is to, in recognition that data enters the system in various places, is to provide a system where experts can review the data in one place. So this shows a screenshot of the verification tools in iRecord, which is a rich, rich interface for reviewing data as individual records or um, the ability to batch verify groups of records. Um, and with the fig at, in 2021, we saw almost 75% um, of data reviewed using these tools and a huge contribution from a range of experts, over 600 contributing in 2021, which, yeah, we're hugely grateful to those who give up their time and expertise for this role. And just to expand on this um, slightly is that the, the Brevi project has particularly helped us to grow this community by demonstrating the tools, um, improving them through feedback and providing training and support in their use. So we are seeing a, a gradual increase in the um, verifiers active year on year. Um, and that includes those that use the tool themselves, but may also access it and then um, incorporate those verification decisions back into the system. And we've benefited particularly through um, funding through the NCEA uh, program supported uh, by DEFRA, involved, particularly working with Natural England to further improve these tools, particularly to look at automation approaches. And we're currently working very actively with Butterfly Conservation and the 
butterfly and moth county recorders to understand their requirements for improving the systems. And just to give a breakdown by region and taxon group, um, relatively even uh, contributions across countries um, and taxon groups is where we, we find is where we do engage with schemes most actively. We, we see um, individuals being involved and act, and reviewing data's data. So we work particularly with the Mammal Society, a number of insect groups, and the lower figures recognize that there are other systems that we're linking to provide to provide a verification role. So that I've already mentioned bird track and the links with BTO. So the bird data from my record will be um, shared with, with BTO experts. And similarly with the plant data, much of the um, verification work is done using through the BSBI's DDB system. And as well as um, experts contributing to the review of data, we also invested in um, making uh, new uh, rules or um, approaches to reviewing data more automatically to flag up data that's outside of the known distribution or uh, at times of year when uh, records wouldn't be expected, for example. So particular emphasis around the brevity work is to work with recording schemes to uh, improve those rules and also put them in a, a system where they can be um, used by others and we can track their updates more effectively. And really grateful to the schemes who've been very active in working with us to improve these rules and make them more widely available. The other side of automation is looking at new ways of doing things, particularly uh, the greater adoption of image classification approaches, which I think is certainly improving in, in terms of their ability to distinguish between uh, taxa where photographs enable identification, that's clearly not all taxa, and also where it's readily, um, well, where it's feasible to take a photo of individuals and where um, data's sufficient volume of images to train the systems. So we're particularly working with international partners in the recognition that this, this role, I think, is done best at a wider geographic scale and consortium. So we've tested the NIA classifier with the existing images in iRecord, and I'm I'm quite um, impressed with the results that we're we're still collating. But we're starting to use these classifiers um, in anger in some applications. So the first, um, well, there's we've been using them in a plant um, app called eSurveyor separately, but we've recently implemented an image classifier again through support from the NCA program in the iRecord Butterflies app, which again, I think it's working, it works very well for that group, given we have, we have a large number of tagged images to be able to train the classifiers. So that reviews the main work on the data capture and review side of the Brevi program. Then I'd just like to pick up on some more, some examples of where that data has been put to use or has been used, or the work we're doing under Brevi to support its use. And I'm going to pick on, uh, give a few examples of these five areas. So the first of which, uh, I guess, quite simply, is is sharing the data from um, from recording schemes that's been entered through Indicia and iRecord to automatically share this with the MBN Atlas on a monthly data on a monthly basis so that the data can be used more widely. So we're growing the number of data sets and the number of records that we're sharing this way um, now now over, well, around well, 70, 70 data sets and 350,000 records. No, 3.5 million records. So that was sharing the data more widely in a more automated way for um, wider use. The other area of supporting outputs that we've been working in is to develop tools for giving feedback to participants, be that individual recorders or 
national recording schemes or verifiers. So a series of tools to provide mapped outputs and chart outputs in an interactive way that's aimed at use via web websites and, app, and mobile apps, for example, with approach taken that, that taking an open source approach and clearly there's lots of ways of doing visualizations online, but with particularly tailoring these outputs to recording schemes and approaches, software and systems that recording schemes are already using. And what Brevi is allowing us to do is to have those discussions with recording schemes to refine what's of most use to the recording schemes and how we um, tailor those visualizations to that audiences. With the idea that the, the visualization tools can be used in multiple systems, so they're not tied to any particular data source, and we provide try and provide good um, examples and demo applications. I say we, Rich, Rich Bertmar, for those who you, those of you know him, has been pioneering this area. And there's some links there in the um, given on the slide, and I'm just going to illustrate the the example of how we've applied these tools within um, I record to have a view on a single species activity, showing um, information such as well a description of the nomenclature for example and some trait information that's available um, in this case through the natural england pantheon system um, recent images that have been submitted and shown on the left these are all shown on the left then the middle panel is a map simplified map of the 10km distribution with the ability to change date classes and, and download in a in a way to use these outputs and other presentations and publications. And then on right is a, a temporal view, uh, the top chart showing numbers of records per year, and then the lower chart showing the phonology of this species, showing that numbers build up in terms of records, number of records tend to peak late summer. So we're just, yeah, we're starting to use these um, visualization tools in anger. And I mentioned the new plant atlas that they'll be used heavily in the online plant atlas that should be that's will be published um, or formally made available sometime early in 2023. So that summarizes the first two data use aspects. Um, I'm now going to move on to um, how we get a better understanding of the spatial bias. Um, and communicate uncertainty in data sets. So then move on to some of the summary of indica indicator and trend work. So in terms of spatial bias and um, being clear on appropriate use of biological records is, I guess, a recognition that we, we're we never going to have probably all the data we want from every place uh, regularly updated. And this is a slight ca caricature, but the this visualization shows um, for data into iRecord um, a sort of exaggerated UK map where each vice county is scaled to the size of the number of records that have come through in the system. So um, clearly this isn't all the data in the system, but it sort of illustrates the problem is that we have a, a tendency for more data to come through the system from some places and others. And so we have a very uneven um, coverage of records at the uh, Great Britain scale. And then also, we also on the right, we also have um, the feature that even at local scales, even perhaps within broadly well-recorded areas, inevitably we've got data from um, a clustered set of locations within a particular area. This is an example of butterfly records from um, Amersham in the UK, but I guess it's true of many places is that records tend to be concentrated. So the question is how we how that affects the uses we want to put to the data. So the work that we've been doing um, in general in this space has been, I guess, pioneered by Ollie Pescott and uh, Rob Boyd is coming up with formal ways of reviewing data sets for their use borrowing expertise that comes from other scientific disciplines, particularly the medical uh, research area where um, 
you know, the decisions you make on the data can be quite uh, important or impactful. So borrowing those ideas about being clear about your target population, what you're trying to give an assessment of, both geographically, taxonomically, et cetera, and what you're trying to understand from that population, um, often trying to infer a trend, for example, and then be clear on where the data comes from and this is how it's cleaned, but then use methods to quantify features of that data, such as um, spatial scale, geographic biases, taxonomic biases, environmental coverage, et cetera. So there's a couple of nice um, papers and packages which sort of go through that process. So we'll be using those to um, assess our, our indicators and trends going forward, for example. And that's important because the other main feature of the Brevi BRC work over the last, I guess, five to 10 years has been extracting much more information from biological records. Uh, I've already sort of shown that it can be very patchy, comes from diverse sources, but there are methods which, which hopefully account for these features of the data to then provide estimates of the status of species over relatively long time periods. This is an example for a bee species showing the estimated occupancy or how frequent it is in the UK since the 1980s and then estimate the change in that occupancy, in this case, a 43% decline. And we can clearly do this for multiple species. So this shows um, all the species analyzed uh, 350 species of bee and hoverfly, hoverflies in blue, bees in red. Each point is a species showing its trend assessment. Below the zero line is a decline, above the line is an increase with a measure of uncertainty. So we can estimate trends for many species, but we are uncertain about a lot of these trends. But we can come up with overall assessments of um, an overall mean decline of around 25% since 1980, but recognizing that there are species that are increasing as well as those decreasing. And for many species, we are relatively uncertain or there's no clear evidence of a trend. So try and be communicating the uncertainty we have around these outputs. And then combining these um, across species to have a, an indicator line across the whole group and begin to see differences in the um, trajectory of change. So the bee declines tend to have been driven by a sequence of relatively poor years since the mid 2000s. And each, so the red indicate a marked decline year on year and the green uh, marked increase year to year. Uh, and for the hoverflies, the decline seems to have been most happening in an earlier period and some evidence of an uptick. And I show the B examples here, but we've been very active in producing trend assessments across uh, many species groups. Summarized here in this bar chart shows the number of species for which trend assessments have been made um, or analyzed. The, the darker color on each bar is the number where we've been able to produce a, an estimate of a trend. The pale is where we've we've produced models but not able to produce, they've not been able to produce a trend but overall shows a large body of evidence to support indicators and reporting. And these have been published to make them available for use by others, um, supporting the uptake of FAIR principles for um, making data available to be reused. And one clear use of this data has been to support indicators at the UK level, shown here for the change in priority species, but also at Scotland, England, Wales um, indicators have also been supported by these types of analysis and types of data sets. And this evidence features heavily in the last state of nature and will be, um, there'll be some updates to contribute to the next state of nature report, for example. So really important evidence, additional evidence to support the more structured schemes, as I said at the beginning, to provide a wider taxonomic view on the state of biodiversity. So the final couple of things I just want to touch on is, so the a lot of the development statistical work has been around trend 
assessments from the data. Um, but there are spatial applications of this data um, and perhaps those spatial applications have probably got a longer history in terms of um, yeah, documenting distributions and looking how they may change under climate change, for example. There was a lot of work on that topic in the early 2000s. But we're starting to um, do a lot more work on species distribution models again within the work of BRC. And we've recently, and I guess the, the key point under the Brevi program is that a key element of this is working with the recording scheme experts to assess these outputs in terms of how uh, realistic they seem in terms of um, estimating the, the distribution of a species, which can then hopefully inform how these outputs are used for other applications, be it to look at the impacts of climate change or to look at prioritization of areas for um, conservation or to look at the impacts of tree planting, for example. So the work that we've we're that's currently in review to be published is um, a, an evaluation of over 500 species distribution models across five invertebrates and one plant group, where the the basic process illustrated here is that the input data is the occurrence of species and um, pseudo absences, or where so where we think an area has been well recorded but the species was not found to then combine that with environmental data such as land cover and climate and elevation, for example. Fitting distribution models, there's a range of algorithms to do this. So fit multiple um, different approaches, bring those together into an ensemble prediction of the distribution of the species together with its uncertainty. And then the, the novel bit for what um, again, Rob Boyd and Oli Pescott have been leading on is is having a structured way of experts reviewing these outputs to score how well they've worked and what the limitations might be. Um, and a key conclusion is that these um, particularly how well that niche can be represented by coarse land cover or climatic factors. So species that require um, fine niches or microclimates um, tend to not predict so well as a sort of very take home summary. So we've been doing a lot of those species distribution reviews and just to flag up the, the talk for next week is that the DECIDE project has been using these model, these sorts of model outputs to communicate to recorders where um, we're perhaps most uncertain of um, the of there's most uncertainty from these models, and so therefore new data will improve the models. Um, in um, yeah, so, sort of rank locations where recording would add most benefit to these models, to then communicate to recorders where priorities for recording may be, um, and providing nice tools to achieve that, and giving feedback on the your own recording, but also recording from others in your area. Um, this has been heavily co-designed with um, recorders and other organizations, and it's being tested particularly on butterfly and moth um, as, a, as case studies. So come next week to Michael Pocock's presentation to hear much more about that. So just to summarize, um, my final slide is that we have, uh, other my acknowledgements, is that we have an amazing legacy and the Brevi work has been really important for working with recording schemes to direct activities to support their huge effort to collect and review and make available biological records. Technologies enhance a lot of what we can do, but there are challenges still in terms of dealing with the volumes and diversity of data. But we have a lot of contributions of people uh, reviewing data. The statistical methods which we have to hand allow us to get much more information out of these data, particularly for measuring change and interpreting what's happening to biodiversity. And a particular focus is that we, I think as well as access to uh, raw data of known quality, a more curated view of biodiversity through atlases and online atlases is incredibly valuable if we want to have um, great under 
uh, greater support for using that data going forward. We know it's been well reviewed, for example, and data products can be important to outputs in themselves to be used more widely. And we're trying to make those available through data sets on species trend assessments and species distribution models. And I guess in summary, the BRC work and the Brevi partnership sits at the interface of the engagement with recording schemes and their experts and to make links to those who, who want and need to use the data, be that researchers or those supporting um, conservation and policy. And I'd just like to finish by thanking well, particularly the, those who volunteer in this space, individuals and organisations, the great support we've had from working with JNCC and colleagues and the our advisory group who have fantastic input and wider insight into um, this area. Particularly I'd like to thank the NCA, pro NCA programme, which has allowed us to sort of accelerate some of these ideas, particularly around data mobilisation. Uh, also the UK um, funding support comes through the UK SCAPE programme to recognise the value of this data for researchers as part of um, NERC's national capability to support wider research use of this data and colleagues for access uh, providing some of the slides. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, David. And yeah, thanks for that comprehensive uh, talk around uh, all that the um, all the work that goes into. We will do some questions. Um, there are quite a few, David. So. Um, I will hopefully if we can't get round to, to all of them, we can potentially um, have some text answers and we can add them to YouTube and and uh, et cetera afterwards, if that's OK with yeah, you, David. Cool. But um, yeah, so to try and get through as many as possible, uh, she says, whilst also managing to lose the page with all the questions on. Um, so I will start with a question that's probably quite a good one that I would imagine people often have, which is what is the difference between iRecord, iNaturalist and iSpot? So they're all three separate systems. I would sort of characterise that iSpot and iNaturalist are very photo led, I think is one key distinction. And they both have a, a sort of community way of um, reviewing records. So anybody can give an opinion on whether something's right or wrong. I record, I guess, been more tailored to the sort of recording approach and, and organizations in the UK, um, allows um, data to be, well, most data doesn't have a photo, for example. So, and that's typical of most biological recording, doesn't really include photos. Um, and fits into the way that recording schemes uh, um, ask for data in terms of how um, extra information is captured in terms of, uh, well, an obvious thing is use of the national grid, but also attributes in terms of life stage, or abundance categories, et cetera. So it's much more tailored to the recording the recording approach in the UK. So I think they all, you know, they all have strengths and weaknesses. I think the I would as a sort of char broad characterization, I think I spot and I naturalist are aimed at perhaps a wider, more diverse audience, perhaps more at the entry level beginner. Uh, so but I record tends to be more used by, I guess, the established recorders um so and as i say we're trying to link up things so that it doesn't so much matter which system people use but um use of iRecord will clearly match what recording schemes expect and therefore has a greater likelihood of being sort of feeding into the applications i talked about i suppose a, a useful follow-on question to that that has been asked and, and may be may demonstrate part um i suppose the fact that though apps can be different that doesn't necessarily mean so the, the well I'll ask the question first sorry are there things to look out for to identify good recording uh, a good recording app to use so suppose um it may be that they're for different sort of uh, skill levels but that doesn't necessarily mean one's better or worse right yeah well I think there's a tension between who it's good for if it's if it's, it can be good for the recorder but it may not be necessarily delivering the data that the recording scheme or data analysts want. So a and clear, clear yeah. 
yeah. Is there an obvious way of spotting that, I suppose? Yeah. Well, I think systems that don't link into the wider infrastructure, I think, I, I think that's a missed opportunity because those data re won't really go anywhere or be used. So I think those that are linking to the, you know, the UK Species Dictionary feed through to recording schemes, local record centres, and the MBN, the plus points. Also, I think, a, a, I guess, a feature of, of I naturalist and I spot is that that data is much harder to analyze trends from because it doesn't doesn't give you much information of what wasn't seen it doesn't really produce sort of lists of species typically so i guess yeah. but i guess it comes down to the motivation of individuals contributing if if they're contributing for their own interest and don't really have so much concern where the data is going then mm. it's yeah a different, different decision if you really want the data to be used in earnest then you probably want to use things like i record bird track etc i suppose a follow-on follow question from, from that as well is around whether or not um the brc approach sort of emerging apps etc for collaboration to try and build those data flows or or um yeah or does it happen the other way around just making sure i'm not misquoting someone's question yeah we start yeah now we've got a sort of proven mechanism with bird track we will be trying to promote that more widely so app developers have the opportunity to link their data in. I think, you know, there needs to be a consideration of, you know, we don't want to overburden verifiers, for example. So there needs to be an assessment of whether it's going to really contribute data um, that the verifiers want to see, for example. But yeah, we can certainly have those conversations. And we were, we are proactively speaking to, to, I guess, the record pool, which deal with amphibians and reptiles. We've got an ongoing conversation with them around this topic, for example. Mm -hmm. And we already we already linked to the mammal mammal tracker app um, as another example. I didn't really touch on, but that feeds through. Great, thanks. I'm going to try and move on to talk about a different um, area that's come up in a few of these questions, which is around sort of the verification side of things. Um, and there's a question about what is the likely impact of eDNA approaches to recording and verification? Yeah, so that's another strand that we're looking at again through the NCA program is how um, yeah how EDN, data coming through eDNA fits into the system whether it needs uh, a verification by experts or or whether the systems need to be adapted to take in eDNA records I think it's the more you look at it it's it's uh, yeah the more questions it raises um, but I think we're trying, I guess what we're trying to do is give good good guidance and standardization around that question about maybe a decision tree about whether it, it may, and it may vary depending on the different types of molecular projects as to whether mm. it's suited to human verification. I think actually, but I think I would say, I, I think where we perhaps got most value is using automated rules to spot outliers. So not necessarily review every eDNA record, but check where there's a probably a problem that's come through the molecular pipelines which is tagged the the molecular sequence to an unlikely species just mm. because of lacking reference material i think in the gene banks for example yeah that makes sense and th well there's another question here that's not about where that happened where those rules exist for the edna but but around um so, well, it is about the rules for, for verification and validation, which is that uh, this says here that I record maps sometimes still show errors, e.g. terrestrial species in the sea. Um, yeah, is, is there, sorry, it'd be simple to validate and flag such basic errors when sightings are first submitted via apps or websites. And I think it's cut off the rest of the question because, oh, yeah, yeah, being picked up at an early stage because well, there, oh, I might have accidentally deleted that question. Sorry to have wrote it, but yeah, I will write it back up in some version. Yeah, so the approach that I record takes is is not, it's just to flag records as needing a check where they've broken a rule, not apply it. But we are looking at whether to automate some of those approaches. And I, yeah, I think that's a fair point that. Um, it happens moving, later, right, in terms of. Yeah, um, and it shouldn't be yeah. seen as a final view on the records. It should be a system for capturing and making them available for review and then mm -hmm. when data flows through to the MBN or other products and they're they've all, they've been through that review process to make them more so but I, I yeah that's a good point that there could be more automation in this 
space for clear things that are clearly wrong mm -hmm. yeah um and then there's a question around i'm sure we've just got two minutes left um that says there are increasingly asks of data that at a local scale often related to planning and slash strategy um we are oh, sorry it's because um we're already looking at modeling but some of these tools particularly around understanding of bias would be really useful uh to apply currently we lack understanding to use such methods are you likely to provide training or resources resources so that brc slash ukch tools can be better applied by other organizations and at the local scale and i promise i didn't write this question to yeah no yeah that's all right that's a great question and i'm glad you asked it because it allows me to mention some work that my colleague francesca mancini is doing she has a knowledge exchange fellowship from NERC, which is, is exactly to do that is to share knowledge of uh, approaches that have been developed, I guess, through research um, is why NERC's funding it, but it's basically the sort of tools that I talked about, about how they could be used locally and understanding the requirements for use locally. So uh, I don't know how to make a link to that, Hannah, whether we can add a link to the... Yeah, I think, I well, I believe we could add it to the YouTube video and I think people will be sent a, a follow-up after this. That's probably the best way to do that is to share that link um, yeah. there or, and potentially in the meeting chat. But I think some people lose access to that after if they're external. So we can, yeah, share it around afterwards because, yeah. yeah, I think it'd be really useful for people to see. Um, as we have just one minute left, I realise there are a number of questions afterwards, but yeah, hopefully, David, you'll be able to give some text responses to those and we can add them and share them where relevant along with that link to Francesca's work. So yeah, it just leaves me to um, say thank you very much, David, for taking the time to speak to us today and I hope that um, folk found it interesting and yeah, look forward to seeing everybody next week um, at the next Teapop talk and yeah, those um, who may have not known much about Teapot beforehand um, and do now, uh, please do uh, email that email address. So yeah, thanks, David.